Palaroga Shark Media. Hello and welcome to Palace Intrigue. I am your host, Mark Francis. On New Year's Day, the royal family typically attends church at St. Mary Magdalene Church in Sandringham. The rest of the day is reportedly dedicated to various outdoor activities, such as horseback riding and pheasant shooting. While many of these traditions are centered around family, Kate and William have not always participated in the celebrations as they have previously spent New Year's with Kate Middleton's parents. In the years leading up to Queen Elizabeth's passing, the usual traditions had to be cancelled due to COVID-19 restrictions and the monarch's declining health. However, last year's celebration marked the return of the Sandringham House tradition when King Charles and Queen Camilla welcomed the start of 2023 with a visit to St. Mary Magdalene Church in honour of his late mother's cherished ritual. Before the Queen's passing, the royal family had a customary New Year's Eve tradition at Her Majesty's Norfolk country estate, Sandringham House. The Queen would host a party that extended past midnight, followed by everyone attending the New Year's Day service at St. Mary Magdalene Church, located within walking distance from the royal residence. These plans were altered due to the coronavirus pandemic, as it made sense for the monarch to do so. This year, there is a strong possibility that King Charles will continue in his mother's footsteps for the festive celebrations, given the royal family's adherence to tradition. It's highly likely that Sandringham, a New Year's Eve party, and a church service the next day will be on the agenda once again. In his book At Home with the Queen, royal family author Brian Hoey revealed another New Year's tradition within the royal family known as Lucky Dip. This game involved staff bringing in a tub filled with sawdust and hidden pieces of paper containing predictions for the new year. Before becoming a royal, Meghan Markle shared her two annual resolutions on her lifestyle blog, The Tig, as reported by The Telegraph. In her post from January 1st, 2016, before her relationship with Prince Harry, she candidly revealed her ongoing resolutions. These make my New Year's resolution list nearly also known as actually every single year, Markle wrote. The swearing comes in lulls triggered by being overworked or feeling mighty cheeky after a couple of drinks. And when it comes to the biting of the nails, well, it still happens with a turbulent flight or a stressful day. It's unladylike, but then again, so is the swearing. Damn it. In the same post, Markle admitted that she had let go of her other annual resolutions, like running a marathon and relearning French, she expressed her primary focus for the new year. For this new year, the only thing I aim to do is to approach life playfully, to laugh and enjoy, to keep my standards high, but my level of self-acceptance higher. My new year's resolution is to leave room for magic, to make my plans and be okay if they sometimes break, to set my goals, but to be open to change, to let the magic know that there is an open door policy with me in 2016, but that is always welcome to join the party. I invite you to do the same. Have a beautiful, blissful, and incredibly magical 2016. So grateful to be with you on the ride. If you find yourself invited to a royal event in 2024, fashion etiquette expert Lucy Hume has tips on what to wear when meeting a member of the royal family. The most formal dress code is white tie, suitable for state banquets or royal events. In white tie events, men are required to wear a white bow tie with a wing collar, while women are expected to don long formal evening gowns. Black tie events call for a shorter dinner jacket for men and a black bow tie. Women attending these events have more outfit choices, such as trouser suits or cocktail dresses. The formality decreases for events involving the royal family, where lounge suits, typical office attire, are acceptable. Finally, there's the smart casual dress code, which allows for a more relaxed look. Hume also mentioned that specific dress codes apply to events like garden parties, where formal day wear is expected, similar to wedding attire, but slightly less formal. She explained, so you could wear a hat, but it wouldn't be 100% expected, but not necessarily stilettos, because you wouldn't want to sink into the grass. Smart, flat shoes would be absolutely fine, while sneakers would be a no-no. For men, a garden party typically calls for a suit, while a morning suit with a tailcoat in either black or grey is suitable for a daytime wedding. Regarding belt colour, Hume advised matching it to the shoes when in the company of royals. Length of garments is a crucial consideration, according to Hume. For instance, at the annual Royal Ascot, the dress code in the main royal enclosure specifies that women's dresses for both royals and guests should extend below the knee and shoulders should be covered. Palace Intrigue will be right back. Lily Ebert, an Auschwitz survivor, marked her 100th birthday with a deeply moving and unexpected gesture from the king, anticipating the traditional congratulatory telegram from the monarch. Ebert was instead touched to receive a personal letter and flowers from the king. 
having endured the horrors of Auschwitz-Birkenau, where she lost her mother, brother, sister to the gas chambers at just 20 years old, Ebert dedicated her life to Holocaust education. Her memoir, Lily's Promise, an international bestseller, includes a foreword written by the king himself. Expressing her humility, Ebert shared her emotions upon receiving the personal letter and flowers from the king. The letter read, Dear Lily, I particularly wanted to write a personal word on the very special occasion of your 100th birthday. The terrible suffering which you and your family endured can never be adequately described or acknowledged. Accompanying the heartfelt letter was a bouquet of flowers and the traditional 100th birthday telegram, both from the king and queen. Ebert's significant contributions to Holocaust education were recognised earlier in the year when she received an MBA at Windsor Castle. The Daily Beast took a look at some of the other scandalous royal families. At first glance, Prince Frederick of Denmark's marriage to Crown Princess Mary of Denmark seemed rock solid. Four children and numerous charitable endeavours showcased their strong bond. However, rumours of an affair with socialite Genevieve Casanova emerged, potentially shattering the idyllic image of their marriage. Another Danish royal, Prince Christian, found himself in the midst of romantic speculations. He was linked to Princess Maria Chiara de Bourbon to Cecile's. However, Chiara swiftly denied these budding romance rumours dispelling the whispers of a royal love affair. The Spanish royals have had their fair share of scandals. King Juan Carlos faced allegations of extravagant trips, alleged kickbacks in a past extramarital relationship. Meanwhile, the Infanta Cristina became embroiled in the news case due to her husband's involvement in embezzlement. Prince Albert of Monaco's romantic life has been quite the spectacle. Acknowledging two children born out of wedlock, he faced rumours about his relationship with Princess Charlene, including sensational claims that she attempted to flee Monaco before their wedding. King Albert II of Belgium initially denied paternity but eventually acknowledged his illegitimate daughter, Delphine Boll, in 2020 following a court-ordered DNA test. And then there is King Maha of Thailand, King Maha's extravagant lifestyle, multiple marriages and controversial actions such as breaking his sister's ankles have kept the world's eyes on Thailand's monarchy. What's particularly intriguing is his reluctance to designate an heir, sparking intense speculation about the monarchy's future. And there you have it. If you'd like to email us, our address is thepalacentric at gmail.com. Please follow us on Spotify, Apple, your app of choice. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out. I'm Mark Francis. My thanks to John McDermott. This is Palacentric. Good times. <laughs> <laughs>